What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Finding Direction podcast. I am beyond excited to have you here as we dive into this week's episode with Alexa Curtis and a little bit about Alexa. Believe it or not, she actually started a blog when she was only 12 years old. I don't know about you, but that's freaking unbelievable. She also went on to be a host of one of the radio Disney shows called Fearless Every Day. And now today she is the host of the Be Fearless Summit where she goes to different colleges and teaches college students all these skills as they transition into the real world. And she's truly doing some incredible work. And on this episode specifically, a few of the things we talk about is how in the first place did she start an idea of creating a blog when she was 12 years old and then go execute on that, do it for many, 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 many years, and also what were all the lessons that she got from that. We also talk about why you should probably go to the coffee shop that you never actually go to. And we get more in depth into what we mean kind of about doing that in the episode, but you should definitely go to a different coffee shop and you'll see why. And we also talk about how do you go through life in general being fearless. Being fearless is one of the most unbelievable skills you can you can hone in your life because as you do this and you step into different things, you become so much more of what you truly think you are capable of. And Alexa walks us through all of that on how you can truly be fearless. All right, so we are going to dive right into this episode. If you have not yet, please make sure you subscribe. And if you have a friend that you know is going through something, send them this episode. And I promise you, they are going to thank you for sending this them for sending this their way. All right, so without further ado, my friends, here we go. We're diving right in. Alexa Curtis, welcome to the podcast. I am uh, very pumped to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited too. Absolutely. And so give us kind of um, a look into your life as little Alexa. Like for you, paint the picture. What was life like for you as you were, you know, little Alexa running around in your life? Oh my gosh. Do you mean how from the beginning or now? From from the beginning, from the beginning. Yeah. Oh yeah. Little me. Uh, So I, I am originally from a really small town in Eastern Connecticut. And I started a blog back when I was 12 called a life in the fashion lane. When I was seven, my father was wrongfully convicted and put in prison in Rhode Island. So the year that he got out, I know you have ties to Rhode Island too. So you know that area when he got out, I started my blog. Yeah. And over the past 10 years have built it out into this full-time lifestyle platform, had a show on radio Disney called fearless every day. And while I was at Disney, which we filmed in LA, I started this new program called the be fearless summit so now i team up with different yeah. colleges to host in-person youth conferences to really get people out of their comfort zone i love it i love it that was beautifully uh that was like your life in 60 seconds i love it so yeah yeah so let's dive into it then so for you you know can you say you grow up um pops goes away unfortunately and i heard from some research you'd like go visit him and do things like that and so Eventually he gets out, you turn 12 years old. And I'm curious, like, what was the spark or the idea for, like, I have two uh, cousins and they're, I believe they're 12. So it would have been the same age. And I'm like, to see them starting like a blog and they're doing, I'm just like, there's no way. Um, I mean, there's a way, but you know what I'm saying? So I'm curious for you, like, how did this whole idea come about? How did, like... Yeah, fill me in. I'm, I'm so yeah. funny because I, I always get asked that, and people are like, "Oh, you're from Connecticut, so you came from money, and you're rich, and you're from Greenwich." And I'm like, "No." And this is way before blogging was not a thing, like influencing, TikToking. This was in 2007, <laughs> so this was yeah. not a common thing. But what ended up happening is, uh, my dad get, did get out of prison, and my sister actually had. She's 16 years older than me, but she had married a guy and was living in Staten Island, which is like right outside of Manhattan. And so I was there one weekend and I always just really liked acting. Like I always really liked being in front of the camera as like a young kid, but I wasn't really good at singing. I wouldn't say that I was a great actress. Uh, And I was at my sister's house and uh, we had read an article basically about this girl and she had started a blog called The Style Rookie. 
And so my sister was just like, oh, you should start a blog. Like, why not? And I was like, yeah, why not? And so I went on her laptop and I just Googled how to start a blog and up came huh. blogger.com. Uh, and I'm pretty sure I just had the name, like a life in the fashion lane. And so I just, it was, so, I mean, it's so easy. It's Squarespace wasn't even around, but I just typed yeah. it in and wrote the post. And then every single day, uh, even when I went back home to my parents after that, in the other like very small town in Connecticut, I just kept blogging. And so then I started realizing huh. that I could reach out to different people. I had read in an article about the word public relations. And so when I was 14, I wrote these terrible grammatically incorrect details <laughs> to different yeah. companies and got myself invited to fashion week. And then I uh, just really? kind of going from there. Yeah. I love that. What would you say is the importance of like, I think one beautiful thing that I've loved enjoying as far as like diving into your story is this sense of like, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to attack it. I'm going to go for it. And it's like that started at such a young age at 12. And I'd be curious for you, you talk to a lot of people as they're in this space of exploring their life and like, you know, kind of figuring it out. I'd be curious, like, what would you say is the importance of taking imperfect action? Such a good question. And there's so much importance in that. And I think a lot of people do look at my story and are like, wow, you started a blog at 12. Like you were so confident. <laughs> That's not how it was. Like I was so insecure <laughs> yeah. for years. I was so broke for years. And I think it's almost opposite. I leaned into my mistakes and I made so many. I mean, the amount of times I can tell you, like I was crying in airports. I was on the floor in New York. Like I couldn't afford hmm. to eat. Uh, and I just didn't let that stop me from continuing to pursue this obsession with entrepreneurship and building a business. And so I think the more comfortable you can get with being uncomfortable, that's how you really become confident. Like I didn't grow up confident and this is like all successful. It was like leaning into those mistakes and letting them enable me to be better and stronger and learn something from them. And that's how I got to where I am now. And the confidence thing comes with that. Yeah. What would you say is the biggest fear you had of if you stopped blogging, if you stopped taking action, like, was there a fear behind that of, oh, well, if I stop this, this is the thing I'm more scared of than actually failing? Yeah, I think that because I did it for so long. And when I got the Disney show, uh, that was a moment when I was like, oh, okay, I can do this. And that took 10 years. So for me, because I didn't come from any money from or any connections, it was always yeah. in the back of my mind of like, I'm not going to go to college and I have no one there standing by me. But it's either this works out or I'm not super spiritual, but I would say that I had the mentality of like, okay, if this doesn't work out, the world is going to give me something that I'm supposed to be doing. And so, I mean, I wouldn't even deny that those thoughts still go through my mind, right? Like I'm 24. What if this doesn't work out? Like God forbid <laughs> I do something and get canceled. I think now that's like a more relative thought in my mind is like, what if I said something that for whatever reason it was taken out of context and now right. the over? I mean, you live with that for days when you're on every day when you're an entrepreneur, uh, but you just have to keep moving forward and let the world do its thing. Yeah. So true. And so for you then, I'm curious, walk us through these, because you said it takes 10 years to get the show with Disney. So that means you got that show when you're 22, roughly. Yeah. Um, so like, what was the the fuel, the motivation you had to keep going? Because like, you know, obviously I, you've had the podcast you do now, the blogging you've been doing for a while. Um, myself, I've been doing this podcast for two and a half years. And I think something people often run into sometimes is like, well, how do I know if I should keep going or if I should stop or kind of all that? And I'm curious for you, like, it sounds like as you went through this process, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. So like, what no. kept you driven to keep creating, to keep doing, to keep um, just like taking action at the end of the day? Yeah, I talk to a lot of people who struggle with that. And, and especially, and I mean, you could probably relate with the podcasting thing as well. It's kind of like, there's some moments where it's like, God, this isn't like, this is so much energy and you make so little money for so long, but the people who really are successful are the ones who tough it out for so long. But I think, and from the research I've done and the entrepreneurs I've interviewed, I personally would say that when you are an entrepreneur, that obsession with just pushing forward and having that fire inside of you, it really doesn't disappear. And even in the moments yeah. where it's so fucking hard, that obsession <laughs> yeah. is still stronger than in the days when it's like, I can't do this anymore. Or like I'm running out of money or whatever. It's just, there's just this fire. Yeah. 
what I've also realized too, is like all of the rejection I have had for years, even now, but especially up until I got that Disney show, something always would come after that. It wasn't what I expected would come, but something always would come. And so that proof was in the pudding for me in theory yeah. of like, okay, maybe this didn't work out in this way, but something better came. And so if you can just always have your toes dipped in other things too, like I had the podcast, the website, I was never sitting, looking at my blog. Like I don't, I'm not inspired today. I have anything to post. I'd be like, okay, I'm going to do a podcast episode or I'm going to work on the summit. And so I would, I would suggest that you always be doing a few different things as well. Anyone. Right. Yeah. Cause it's interesting too. I think sometimes you have this thing you want to do and it's like, well, really this thing you want to do doesn't take let's say 40 hours of work week. And what I've almost noticed for myself of like, if there is those blank spaces where you have that extra time, like that's where you get in your head. That's where you go crazy. That's where you're like, uh, well, I'm not getting this and that and the other. And it's like, you, like you said, you need to have multiple creative outlets where you can use your energy to like grow yourself. Um, because if you just like, if you have that space, sometimes what I've noticed at least is in that space, that's where it can get kind of um, chaotic. Would you say that that at all is similar 100%, for you? A hundred percent. And I would also say that I encourage people to not look at like TikTokers, TikTokers or Instagrammers as their idea of success and to really look at, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of the Kardashians, but like look at <laughs> the fact that Kim Kardashian started Skims, the fact that Reese Witherspoon started Hello Sunshine, the fact that Sarah Blakely of Spanx started this red backpack fund. And I think that that's a great example of when you're at the top, these people are not just like, okay, I'm at right. the top now because what would they do all day? They started other projects. And so it's just really apparent to me that that is the way that you continue to build is that you don't ever let yourself just have that standstill because I can guarantee you every one of those entrepreneurs woke up one day and was like, like, do I even like this anymore? Like, what do I do? Like, I, and I already have all the money. So yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah. hundred percent. And it's like, I, like I do a lot of work with Tony Robbins and one of the things he talks about too, is he's like, I'll, he's like, I'll work with some of the wealthiest people in the world, smartest people in the world. And it's like, you have some people that they sell a company for multi-billion dollars and two weeks later, you know, they, they have fun, they celebrate. And two weeks later, they're like, their achiever mentality is like, I, I need something to do. I need something to create. And so yeah. if you're not always giving yourself that thing, um, you can fall into some of those bad patterns. And so I guess for you then, like, let's say we keep going down the story, you get to 22 years old and kind of fill us in on like, how does this whole Disney thing come about? Like, are you just someone that for the last 10 years, you're like, I'm going to send emails every day to people. And finally it picked up with Disney or like, kind of how did that come about? So, yes, I was someone who always sent emails and harassed <laughs> people until they replied, but I had moved to Boston and I actually really struggled with that. I was pretty still struggling, like pretty broke when I first moved there. And then I was starting to do these TV segments every, every week and making a ton of money. I mean, I didn't like them, but I was making a ton of money for someone my age, still trying to figure out all of these things, having no one to like walk me through taxes and all this stuff. Uh, and so yeah. I got this apartment that I really liked there. I was living in a one bedroom and it was great. I was dating this guy in Connecticut. Um, and I just woke up one day and was like, I don't want this. Like I started this nonprofit. I have an office. I have this apartment. My boyfriend's there. I love my friends. And I was like, oh my God, like this is not what I want out of my life. I want more. And I don't think it's going to happen in Boston because as much as I appreciated this nonprofit, it's not my sweet spot. My sweet spot is the TV yeah. stuff. And so I found this list online happy to like send it to anyone, you, whatever. Uh, that was just this phenomenal list of every agent, manager, uh, producer, everyone top in Hollywood and all huh. their emails. And I still have no idea who made this website, but it's called like anyone who knows anyone. And I went through one day when I was living in Boston and found all the executives at like STX and Disney and Paramount and pretty much BCC them all in this email. And uh, that was just an introduction to me. I, at the time had the first podcast that I did, which was quite successful. So I had a lot of yeah. experience in the space of talking to people and so I just was like, Hey, I'm Alexa Curtis. I started a blog when I was 12. I have a podcast. I'm on TV a lot. Would love to set a meeting. Yeah. Uh, and I got one reply from an assistant to the guy. He no longer works there, but Phil Greeny, who was the head of radio Disney. And it was like, Phil got your email and would love to meet with you if you live in LA. And I uh, texted a friend of mine from child and was like, is there any chance you would ever want to move to LA? He also had moved out and 
was doing online school. Like I finished high school and he was like, I don't know. I would do it for three months. And I was like, I guess we're going to do life. So I found a place. I subwed it out of <laughs> nice. found a place like four days later on Craigslist and started having meetings with them. And then in that three month period, got the show. That is so cool. Oh, it's an interesting story. Yeah. What would you say is the importance of always putting out like feelers? Like it seems like there's almost the sense of everything you've done. You're, you're like, not that throwing spaghetti is the correct analogy, but you're like, I'm going to be a, a four year old kid and just, th- or two year old, however old kids are when they're throwing their food. Uh, but just doing that and then like things stick. And it seems like for you, it's just been like, let me throw a spaghetti. Let me try this. Let me do it. And the things that have stuck have been great. You, you asked earlier, I think something about failure. Like if you're failing, the only way I think you're failing is if you just stop introducing yourself to people or reaching out to people or are scared that you're going to be rejected. And that stops you from reaching out. I think it's also very similar with podcasting. Like I uh, know a lot of people who have successful podcasts and even just have podcasts they've been doing for forever. And it's the same that like when you email a bunch of guests, you don't know that like tomorrow Gary V is going to say, yes, he might, he might not, but it's (laughs) like, you have to introduce it to a hundred thousand people. And like one of them, it will stick and the next it won't. And then it'll stick again. Yeah. Do you have any tips to people on how you can reach out more effectively? Because obviously you've thrown lots of spaghetti. So what's a way someone can throw spaghetti maybe with a little bit more accuracy? So I have a little secret and and a lot of people don't pick up on this, but I think that if you make a fake assistant for yourself, and I always say (laughs) on behalf of yourself, that is very important. Uh, I have done a lot of things and I would say that it's because of this like person that emails on my behalf. And I've also paid publicists in the past and they didn't do anything. So really only rely on yourself or your fake assistant. And second of all, I would say, I think it's really important to not DM people. I know a lot of young people are like, I'm going to DM. I did this GMA good morning America segment a few weeks ago. And the number one thing that I did an Instagram live with the producer after, and she was like, I hate when people DM me. Like if you DM me and you're like, can I come on GMA? It's like, no DM me and say, can I have your email and then send a pitch email? Unless it's something like, Hey, I'm Mm, introducing myself. I want to work at your company. I'm going to send you an email after this. Like, okay. But I think to rely so heavily on Instagram versus like LinkedIn, is not effective. And then I always say have a media kit, some form of a bio, because I think it's really important to reduce the BS in business. I always say that. So if you can just make it really condensed when you email someone, what do you want out of them? But also making it, how are you going to impact whatever you're emailing for? Yeah. I love that. It's like clear, concise to the point. Yeah. And sometimes like the email that I wrote to all those producers, it wasn't necessarily clear, but obviously they're thinking in some capacity, she wants some type of show. She wants some type of engagement with us. So you can do that introductory email. I still included all those materials in it too. Right. Yeah. And I love the, the fake assistant too. So you'll write them and it'll be like, like, Hey, this is Janie on behalf of Alexa. And we're reaching out because of, and that you'll just kind of do something like that. Yeah. And I still have, I have, I still have three full-time employees, especially with the summit, um, who work for me, but this girl is a long story of basically a British airways flight that I got for free when I was like 16, they were flying me there. I couldn't get into the lounge. And so I decided to go into the bathroom and make this woman's email as like an at Gmail and showed it to the people at the front of the at the front of the British Airways, like Heathrow Airport Lounge, and was like, okay, I'm not going to say her name, but like, I'm just going to say Morgan. Yeah. Like, Morgan's out of office, like, get me into the lounge. And this email got me into the lounge. And then I was like, how else can I utilize this? And for years, yeah, I would say, like, even with follow ups, whatever. And I mean, I no, I didn't vote for Trump. I'm not a Trump fan, but Trump would also do this. Like, when I saw that he, there was a few times he would call people and pretend he was a reporter. And that's not where I found the idea, but I heard a few huh. interviews and was like, wow, like, do I talk to people actually do this? There's got to be something in it. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's crazy. That's yeah, that's it's smart too because it like builds credibility for you. You know, yeah. like anybody that gets the email, they're like, "Whoa, they got an assistant!" Like, okay, like you're clearly doing something right. And yeah. so from there, now you have this kind of stature as you come in and you get introduced. And yeah. uh, meanwhile, you could be in your bedroom sitting on your bed, like sending these emails. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anything works. I love it. I love it. So then, let's go from 
you know, you're doing stuff with Disney. I'm curious, how does all of a sudden the Be Fearless Summit, like how does that come about in this idea, the inception, the execution, um, kind of walk us through that. Yeah. So I, I think it was when I had, when I had just signed with Disney, it actually might've been, I don't know. It might've been a bit before I had had this idea. I want to say, actually it was right before. And I think like January of 2018 to create this concept of college summits. Now I had no idea. I never went to college, so I didn't know how much bureaucracy is involved in the budget. Like I had no idea. So I wrote this mock business plan and sent it to a hundred colleges thinking they're all going to say, yes, this is genius. No one replied for a year. And about in June, when I had written that pitch email to Disney, uh, I gave up on it. And then I spoke at the Pennsylvania conference for women in Philly. And there happened to be a booth there from Drexel. And I was like, ah, like whatever. So I walked up to the girl and was like, can I ask, you know, what's your position at Drexel? And she was like, I'm the head of marketing and events. And I was like, oh, I am speaking at this conference. I have this concept, you know, would you be open to a meeting? And yeah. she was like, sure. So I stayed in Connecticut and went back to Philadelphia the next week. And they were like, we're not going to give you any money for it, but we're happy to give you the space and work with you on having this event. And I was like, okay, great. And so they gave me the date in March and we hosted the first one. And I just remember watching and looking at all of the speakers and the responses I had gotten from people afterwards and was like, oh man, like this is maybe, I always say those ideas that are the ones that have the potential. I always look at them as kind of the money ideas. And I was like, I think this has that money idea potential. And so then I really struggled being at Disney and trying to build it. I didn't do much there and they didn't really want me doing other things outside of having that show. And so then uh, I had the Drexel Summit and then COVID happened. And so we hosted two in COVID, one with UC Berkeley and one with Vanderbilt. And now our first funded one by a college is February at UConn. Nice. And so for these other ones, they were like, we'll get you through the bureaucracy. We'll get the red tape away. Like you can have a space at this college. You just have to do everything. Yeah. And so I realized the back door is really working with the sponsors. Now, the first Hmm. one that I did with Drexel was actually with the head of people at Drexel. So you're working with actually people who work there. The next two I did were in partnership with student groups. And so it wasn't there wasn't as many hoops to go through. There was more flexibility. Now, when UConn came to me, they basically said, we have $10,000 and we want this type of concept. Can you send a proposal? And that was the longest back and forth I think I had ever done with a college. And the whole time I was just thinking like, is this really worth it for the 10K? Like (laughs) this offsite, but I not only am from that area, but I just see a lot of value in giving it to students and having the ability to work with them so that I know that people are going to come. Right. Just so it's not all this work and you do it off site and 10 people show up. Right. Cause when you're on campus, it's like, okay, go to that, go to that hallway or that, you know, hall room or whatever. Yeah. It's very yeah. accessible. And require, yeah. And they can require you to go versus the other ones that I did. <laughs> there was yeah. no real requirement from the top people at the, the universities. Right. Yeah. Love it. So then one of the big things that you talk about, you speak on, you, I think live most importantly is this concept of like being fearless. And I would ask like, what would you say are a few ways that people can live their life more fearlessly? The number one way that you can do that is every single day, do something that gets you out of your comfort zone. And people really (laughs) are scared of being uncomfortable. And you do not need to be skydiving or bungee jumping or starting a company to be uncomfortable. Look, you can try a new coffee shop. You never know who the person in front of you might be that gives you the idea that you've been wanting or the job that you've been wanting. Uh, So doing something like that, even something that can be on a more personal thing, like maybe you really don't like walking, but like, why don't you try a walk once a week and see what comes out of it? So I would say definitely that. And also even going back to what we said at the beginning, dipping your toes in other things. Like if you have a nine to five traditional job, that's different than what I do. What about pursuing something on the side or starting a profile on Fiverr, Upwork, trying out graphic design? Like why not? And also why not make some money out of it? Because I really do think the American dream is everyone wants to be very wealthy and ideally work for themselves or be flexible and be able to work from wherever And the minute you can jumpstart that, even if you don't have that money idea, the closer you will be to getting that dream. Yeah. Yeah. I think too, when it comes to like, I use the word uncomfortability, which I don't really think is a word. Uh, But like I was taught 
really early when I kind of got into this entrepreneurship world that successful people do what's uncomfortable until it becomes comfortable and that's why they're successful. And I think it's like to create a truly tremendous quality of life for you and not just you, your family, maybe you have kids one day for uh, making your parents proud, you, all these things. Like if you want to create a tremendous quality of life, it's being willing to consistently get yourself uncomfortable as much as possible. Right. And, and it's like, I know at least for me that the moments that have changed my life the most and like shaped my life the most are the uncomfortable. And, and I love what you say before I get to this, that it's like, even just starting with the small things, like do the small things that get you uncomfortable, because at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're building an uncomfortable, uncomfortability muscle, right? Like you're training yourself to go, I never go to that coffee shop. It's kind of weird. I don't know if I know anybody, but okay, I'm going to go. Yes. And you're like, well, I never go on walks, but like, okay, I'll go on a walk. And then all of a sudden now when this big uncomfortable thing comes, your brain kind of goes, no, no, wait, wait, wait. But you did the coffee shop and it was a good result and you did the walk and it was good. And I think what I've noticed in my life is it's those moments where you take an uncomfortable action and you almost feel like you're going to like throw up after you, you make this decision. You're like, oh, this is like so uncomfortable, so foreign, this could go so wrong. But when you really step into that and move through it, it's always the most life expanding experience. And like, maybe you crush it, it goes really well. And on the other side, you know, the thing I think which stops people from taking action is you're like, well, then what if it doesn't go wrong and I fail and I'm a failure and what are my friends going to think because of all that? But I think one of the biggest perspectives I've learned to take on and I'm always practicing, it's, you know, I'm not perfect at this, but it's like realizing that failure is just stepping stones. Yeah. Like because you fail it, you should not attach that to your identity of mm -hmm. I'm a failure. It's like, truly, if you want to create a tremendous quality of your life again, kind of going down that rabbit hole, you fail, you learn, you learn how to improve, you learn how to get better and you do it again. Yeah. Right. And if you consistently go down this path of, okay, how can I fail? How can I improve? How can I do better? It's like, you're going to, again, create this tremendous quality of life for yourself. And I think a, a lot of the reason, unfortunately, people don't create these tremendous quality of life is they're, they don't want to get uncomfortable. And right. also when it comes to fear, there's so much uh, fear around failing when the reality is like fear is one of the most beautiful life expanding teachers that you can ever get in your life to get you to where you really want to go. So true. I am obsessed with the comment about building the build. What'd you say? The, the muscle building, building the, the uncomfortability muscle. That is so true. And that's how often you have to do it. And I have to say, even when I started at Disney, I've never been so uncomfortable. Like I felt like I was <laughs> in high school and I basically dropped out of high school. I mean, it was slightly traumatic. I was not aware of HR departments and board meetings. It was like, you're the new kid on the block and that sucks. Yeah. But I learned so much from that. And the amount of times I literally called my mom and was like, I'm so scared. Like to walk into this room and you're getting looked at like, who's this chick? It was so scary. But every day I was like, just go in and smile and be really nice and um, give them nothing to talk about and just make them like you. <laughs> yeah. And it's so scary, but you just have to do it. Yeah. And, and it, yeah, it is scary. Like owning that fact, like you're going to step into this thing. And like one of the things, again, Tony Robbins is a mentor to me says is he's like, courage is being scared shitless and doing it anyway. Yeah. You know, like for me, I've always debated, uh, getting this tattoo on my wrist and it's like a combination of faith and courage. And I feel like in life, if you can have faith to like blindly step into something and just say like, I'm going to get uncomfortable. I'm going to like have the faith that, that it's going to work out. And then also as you have that faith, build this courage of like, I'm scared shitless and I'm going to step it anyway. I feel like if you can combine those two, um, it, it makes such a difference in your life. And look, if you don't have that faith, courage, your d direction, purpose, what like, what do you have? You know, uh, a few days ago, my boyfriend of like eight months decided to call me and was like, I don't want to be in a relationship anymore. I've decided I want to answer to no one. And I was like, can I ask you why? And he was like, I am too obsessed with money and being like, I'm driven by money and that's really all I care about. And I was like, okay, if that's your answer, sure. But also what are you going to do when you're at the top and you've made all of this money 
then what, what we really have is relationships in life and connections with people. And that's what really gives you happiness. And so I urge everyone to really look at like, okay, so you want to be really successful and you want to make all that money. And then when you're at the top, you can either have no one, or you can wait a little bit longer and be a little bit more persistent and a little bit more resilient. And that's how you will get everything. It's not that difficult to have everything. The only time it's difficult is when you give up. Yeah. And it's like, so many people I think have this ideology of when I get the money or when I'm successful or like this, that, or the other, then I'm going to be happy. And it's like, there's so many sad stories of people that have the success, have the money and they're miserable. Um, you know, like there's a saying, it's like the worst thing is like, uh, someone who's rich and miserable. Cause you're like, you have everything. Like you got the resources, you got the money, you can do what you want and you're miserable. It's like, you really do have to structure your life. I think in a way where it's like, what, like someone once taught me, it's like you have boulders in your life and then you have stones and then you have like pebbles and then grains of sand. And it's like the boulders are, what are the most important things to you in your life? And if you almost had a vase, it's like first put in the boulders and then what's next important to you. And then put in those like stones. And then eventually you get down to the grain of sands where it's like, what are the things that are still important to you, but you can fill in in those empty pockets of time. And it's like building your life in the sense of what's most important to you. Um, And, and I think, yeah, beautifully, like you're saying, realizing that it's, it's not the money. It's not this, um, you know, I'm going to get here one day and I'm going to be this significant character in the world and I'm going to have all this uh, attention. And it's, it's, it's sometimes almost simpler than, than we make it. I agree. I think this may or may not, I'm not may or may not. This is my favorite podcast episode I've ever (laughs) done uh, because all of this is just so critical in the journey to finding your purpose and just being ultimately happy. So I think that you and I both are on the same page with all these things and everyone listening should truly like believe in this concept and not admire other people who are really just so money hungry or fame hungry or success hungry. Yeah. And, and, one thing you said there that I think is so fundamental is believe. And mm-hmm. it's like, like I, I work with so many people and I think the biggest first step is like believing that you can have a life that you really enjoy, that you love, that you get to do things that light you up. Like Jim Carrey has this one speech and it's been playing through my head and it's, it's I'm like, this dude articulated this most beautifully ever. He said, so many people in life choose practicality disguised as fear Mm. that like so many people are like i'm gonna do this because it's the safe path and because this is the more practical thing but really it's fear it's fear and and it's like he tells the story of his dad where he's like his dad built this life on safety and his dad could have been this great comedian but he said like i'm gonna pick the safe route and when jim carrey was 12 his dad got laid off and they had to do everything to survive and he realized like if you can fail at what you don't love then you might as well you might as well take a chance of doing what you do love. Agreed. Yeah, ex- agreed. And and it's very easy to get comfortable. And even when I was young in in Boston and was like, God, I'm dating this guy and this is going great and I've got this apartment, but I'm too comfortable. I'm someone <laughs> who thrives on being uncomfortable. Like I am <laughs> yeah. desperate. I want to make mistakes. So if you are the opposite of that, then you don't have to be as obsessed with the idea of failure in return of being successful like I am. But I still urge you, if you have moments where you're like, is this really what I want for the rest of my life? Don't ignore those moments because they really are going to pave yeah. the path for the life that you're going to live. And at the end of the day, how many years do we get between like 80 and 100? I mean, <laughs> yeah. that's- that's, that's fucking scary to think of. And people are sitting there like, I hate my job. I hate my life. I hate my girlfriend. Why? You're going yeah. to die. Like you are going to die. Like, well, you want to be on your deathbed being like, I could have had so much more if I tried a little bit harder or became a little bit more uncomfortable. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Mic drop. Yeah. <laughs> Life is real. Like it's not a game. It's not a video game. Like it's real and it's what you make it. Yeah, it's like, there's another thing. It says like, life is a scary thing. Nobody makes it out alive. Yeah. It's like, you're, and it's, you're, it's true. It's true. So it's like, you might as well do everything in your power to enjoy this process. Like too many people, unfortunately struggle through life and accept it and, and take on the beliefs that, okay, well it's okay. You're just supposed to get through life and struggle. Um, and I think, 
you know, even if anybody's listening to this and they're going through it, it's like making a decision to say, I'm not going to accept that. I'm not going to believe that. I'm going to set a higher standard for my life, for the people around me. Um, you know, especially for anybody has the, that has kids. It's like, if you have a kid and I don't have kids yet, one day I will. But it's like, you look at someone who has kids, it's like, you're the example that your child will refer to for the rest of your life. And if you went through your life living scared, living fearful, living, you know, like life's just something you struggle with, you are by default, and this is harsh, setting up a cruel path for them to live. And um, so you gotta, you gotta, you gotta own it and say, I'm gonna set a standard to to figure out this thing called life because you got one shot. And uh, if you can figure it out, it's one of the most beautiful things. And don't go, you know, don't uh, start your mistakes all over again. A lot of young people, myself included, you go back to something or something wasn't right from the beginning, but you're like going to give it another try. There's only so many times you can give something or a a person another try. So it's like, there's always an expense. I always think at some point to letting someone back into your life or going back to a job in some capacity that was toxic. So it's like, is it worth the expense of your own happiness or your own personal well-being? Usually no. Yeah. So I'm curious for you then, and I I heard part of this in a podcast I was listening to that you did, but like for you, how do you feel like you've ultimately kind of found the purpose that you're living in today? All of the mistakes, all of the trial and error. But I would say when I was living in New York and then I moved to Boston and started this nonprofit that was on social media and mental health, I was still really focusing on fashion at that time. But to me, I found that through the experiences of me sharing more of my life and being more raw and vulnerable, I not only helped heal myself through a lot of the trauma I went through as a kid, but I found the sweet spot and that that's my purpose is sharing these experiences and allowing other people to know that it's okay to make mistakes and especially young people. And that really truly is, I think my purpose is, I don't want to say inspiring people, but is inspiring people in some capacity through my own life journey. And in return, I hope that they will walk away with feeling something similar or having a little bit more hope because I did it for so many years with nothing and no one and no hope, but I just kept going. And so I think that's a huge mission of mine is how can I let anyone know that anything they go through, you have to make into a positive light and not be defined by your stories or your failures. Yeah. I love that. And I think, um, I just want to take a second to say to you as well, that I think you're so in alignment with that. Um, you know, just from researching you and seeing what you're doing with like the summit and your podcast and like everything you do, it's like, you are you are willing to step into the fear for other people and that is such a superpower in its sense where where you're saying this thing may scare me and i may not know how to do it but i'm going to do this because if i do this i can serve somebody else i can help someone else and uh just kudos to you and and how much you're stepping into that and i'm curious kind of in alignment with that um if people want to get more info on you and see what you're up to follow everything you're doing uh where's the best place for them to find you Sure. Well, same, same to you. I love this podcast and it's so nice. Sometimes I do podcasts or interview people and it's just not a great conversation all the time. And so I really <laughs> love when someone is so good at talking, but uh, the, Thanks. my website is life unfiltered with Alexa.com. And then social media is Alexa underscore Curtis. And then the summit one is be fearless summit. Okay, perfect. And we'll put those in the show notes too. So everybody can get access to it. And for all my uh, East Coast fam. Hopefully we'll see you at the Be Fearless Summit. That'll be fun. And so um, last question I have for you is a question we ask every guest because we want to help people find direction, but do it through action is what would you say is one thing someone listening to this can do in the next 24 to 48 hours to start finding direction in their life? Get uncomfortable like write a list of things that you have been wanting to do. And if you don't have a list of things, then you really should find something that you want to do because you probably are living in some capacity a boring life. And I don't want to see anyone lead a boring life and then mark them off. And you don't have to do that in 48 hours, all of them, but just start somewhere small. And I always like to go back to the thing of like starting a profile on Upwork or Fiverr. Just, I'm a huge fan of people having multiple streams of revenue, even if you have a traditional job, because I did for years, like had so many different streams of revenue. And I think that's really partially how I found my purpose at such a young age is because I was learning so much through all these things. I hated TV segments. I really didn't like social media, but I love to write. And so I just kept doing that. And so I think that's the best first step is do something that makes you a little uncomfortable. 
Yeah. I love it. And start building that uncomfortability muscle. Like yes. go to the coffee shop, take the walk, like do the thing that makes you want to throw up eventually. Yes. Um, love it. Love it. Love it. Well, Alexa, thank you again so much for being here on the podcast. I've massively enjoyed this conversation and kind of just, um, really diving into your life and your fearlessness, your vulnerability. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. It was such a blast as well. Absolutely.